So let's start uh, near, near the beginning. You, you come to Britain in 64. It's the year of the Civil Rights Act in America. In between that year, any number of nations in uh, Africa and uh, the Caribbean are becoming independent. Uh, it's six years after the uh, uprisings in Notting Hill. It's this moment when the diaspora is speaking more or less the same language, the language of, uh, of human rights, of civil rights. Um, how are those currents running through you, a 19-year-old, 19, -year -old, 19 mm -hmm. um, uh, arriving in Britain uh, uh, from Grenada via Trinidad, um, how are those currents running through you? I will answer in one second, Gary, but let me first do something which I think is absolutely necessary. And that's to thank Suleiman and Joy and Milverton and Deborah for putting this film together. By the time I came to Oxford, believing that I would be a priest, all sorts of things had already happened in the Caribbean, as you've suggested. And one of the things that became very obvious to me on arriving here was that as the receiver of a colonial education, we'd been told many damn lies by our British educators. They presented a view of Britain which was false, incomplete, distorted, and above all, it excluded a huge slice of the population, the white working class. We did not believe, or were we given any reasons to believe that there was a white working class in this country? Or there were people doing menial jobs? Or there was poverty? Because the view we had, what was projected through the education that we received, was an elitist, middle class, white, Eurocentric education. <coughs> that was one problem. The other problem, of course, was that before coming to, to England, I think I had met two Jamaicans in my entire 19 years. <coughs> I had met some people from St. Vincent because I'd been there, Trinidad, of course, because I lived there, Barbados, because we had to fly through Barbados to get to Grenada in those days, and a lousy experience it was. <laughs> some people would know what I'm talking about. But let me, go, let, let me not even go there. Um, <laughs> so. What this place did for me was to give me, as Tim Hector was saying in the film, give me a more Caribbean identity by virtue of discovering the Caribbean in Britain. I discovered the Caribbean in Britain. And that is true of many of us. Um, so to be able to relate to how those people from Jamaica and all the struggles that they went through in Jamaica or in Barbados or wherever, were relating to us. We forgave them for calling us smallies, small islanders. <laughs> we just put that down to Jamaican backwardness. <laughs> quiet, quiet in the back. <laughs> um, but we united. We united around what we found, our common experience of being black, unwanted, and oppressed in this society. I remember one of the first books that I read was a book by a sociologist called Sheila Patterson. Oh, and strangers. the book was called Dark Strangers. And I thought, who the hell is she to be calling me and the likes of me Dark Strangers? Doesn't she understand anything about British and imperial history? And I left that there. I never engaged with Sheila Patterson. So it was a matter of understanding who we were, what we were, what constituted us as we were in the Caribbean, relating that to the situation of black people in the United States, 
what their own struggles were against racism, against the, 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 the state in, 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 in the US, and how that related to what was actually happening in Africa. Because when I was younger, my education about Africa came from my father. He couldn't read and write. But the BBC ought to put a monument to that man. Because from the time I was small and I knew him, he always had a radio at his side. BBC World Service. And he listened to that round the clock. Pathé News and so on and so forth. Um, and we talked. We talked a lot about what was going on in Africa. He was very troubled <clears throat> by the murder of Patrice Lumumba. He loved Lumumba. He used to have conversations with one of our icons, historical figures in Grenada, called Theophilus Albert Marichaud, father of our nation. And what amazed me as a child growing up, getting a scholarship to go to this college in, this, in, the, in the city in the, and so on, was the ease with which my father felt totally confident, even though he was illiterate, in talking about matters with those people. He had been to Aruba and was refining oil for the Lago Oil Company in Aruba. There he worked with Rupert Bishop, Maurice Bishop's father, and incidentally with Eric Gary, who became the tyrant in, 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 in Grenada. They were all in Aruba together. Um, he'd had that experience. He'd worked in the, in the uh, oil fields of Trinidad and Tobago. So he didn't, have a, he didn't have a small island mentality. Um, born in Grenada, illiterate because his mother shipped him off to his godmother. She couldn't mind all of them, all, all of his siblings. She ran a bakery, and she used him as child labor. So f at the age of five, he was going into the forest collecting huge bundles of wood that no child should be allowed to carry to go and act as fuel for her bakery and so on, and then going to deliver the bread, again, with baskets of bread that no child should be expected to carry. But in spite of all of that, he had an expansive vision of the world and of what we as African people should be. So I came equipped with all of that, which helped me to understand what was going on in the United States of America? In December 1964, Malcolm X spoke at the Oxford Union. In that same month, Martin Luther King passed through Britain on his way to Oslo to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. He then later spoke at the, at the St. Paul's Cathedral, and so on. So all of these things were coming at me from, from everywhere. Harold Wilson was in some tete-a-tete -tete with a fellow called Ian Smith, who was declaring unilateral declaration of independence in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and doing all sorts of other things. Smithwick, 1964, and the parliamentary candidate who asserted if you want a nigger for a, na for a neighbor, vote liberal or labor. People were talking openly in those <coughs> ways. That was somebody hoping to get into parliament saying that. So Nigel Farage has, has his predecessors. <laughs> um, so all of those things were happening. And there I am. You saw the garb. You know, I'm in my robes as a friar, very studious and diligent and um, holy, I might tell you, um, <laughs> um, dealing with the Gregorian chant and the uh, theology and the philosophy and so on and so forth, we were made to learn Greek in order that we could read the New Testament in Greek. I learned Hebrew and Aramaic so that I could read the Old Testament in Hebrew. And then, of course, Latin was my favorite subject. I mean, it, it was like water of a duck's back, um, top A level in Latin, for example. So all of that was going on in the cloisters. But in addition to doing my contemplative stuff and so on, I found myself in Cowley in Oxford. 
And there they were the, as the film said, the children of car workers working at the Austin <clears throat> Morris car plant in Cowley in East Oxford, and their wives or partners uh, typically working in the Radcliffe or Churchill teaching hospitals in that city. And then I got to know of the work of the late Lord David Pitt and the campaign against racial discrimination, which I joined even when I was in the cloth. So I think it is all of those things which got me to question, well, not so much the relevance of the Roman Catholic Church, but what I was doing there. Right. I mean, because there is a pathway, isn't there, if you think <clears throat> in that time of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, in this country there's Huey, there's Wilfred Wood, there is a pathway to a form of radical black politics that comes through religion. Um, uh, so what was but, it? But not radical theology. That was, not necessarily. That was sadly lacking. Theology. Yes, yes. Uh, and so what was it that f prompts a break with you uh, <clears throat> away from religion and, um, uh, and more explicitly into direct political action? Um, a, a couple of things. Um, okay, so I was the only black uh, student or novice in my year of, out of 19 people. The Dominicans had two houses, one in Stellenbosch in South Africa and the other one in Witwatersrand. Um, and it was a custom as we neared ordination, for the dean of studies from those places to come to Blackfriars in Oxford. And um, we would sit around in the senior common room or whatever it was called, drinking lashings of beer. Um, the one thing I've never understood about these religious orders is their, their penchant for alcohol. <laughs> Chartreuse, the liqueur, Benedictine, the liqueur. If um, they're not going to let them have sex, they have to have some kind of... <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so we brewed something like 36 gallons of strong ale oh, wow. in the crypt of the priory, and we downed that in a fortnight. <laughs> and, I mean, thankfully, there were many saints in the calendar. So we, <laughs> we, we celebrated the saints' day of the lowest of them. We didn't have to... <laughs> And uh, any, any excuse for a booze up. So um, on one of those occasions when this, this, this dean came over, we had supper, lavish supper, and then we were downing the booze in the common room. Meanwhile, this fellow is talking to the 19 of us about what really were career prospects. Were they going to come to South Africa to be parish priests or university chaplains or whatever? And I noticed that throughout the period we were there, my man averted any eye contact with me. Although I was penetrating him with my eyes. <laughs> and he went on and he went on and he went on. And then when I couldn't stand any more of it, I put my hand up and I asked him, what might I be? University chaplain or parish priest, and he looked absolutely shocked and said to me, well, you know the answer to that. I said, well, actually, no, I don't. Um, I want you to tell me. And then he went on, well, you understand it is a party and uh, we've got to work within the system in order to help to transform it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you came, you would be in the house where our black trainees are and there is no question of you being able to be a university chaplain and so on. So I said to him, and what would Jesus have done? <laughs> he became as red as a cherry, waffled, <laughs> and I stopped listening. And I think there and then I decided, you see this? You people are having a laugh. Because it wasn't only South Africa, it was the fact that the, 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 the Roman Catholic Church was supporting all of these Salazar and all of these tyrants. Mm. 
totalitarian regimes across Latin America. They were all staunch Catholics. And the church did not stand with the poor against them. So they had the, the diocese, not the diocese, the order had this ambition that I would finish in Oxford, go to the papal college in Rome, there to learn to be a bishop so that I could become the first um, uh, local bishop of Grenada and the Grenadines. So by deciding to leave, I scuppered all of their plans. But it was my engagement with those children in Oxford, the work I did with a wonderful woman now passed on called Anne Dummett, whose husband, Michael Dummett, was professor of logic at All Souls College. And he, too, worked with us. Um, Anne was the principal community relations officer in Oxford. And uh, I was made the chair of the education subcommittee of that community relations office. And I did all of those work harassing head teachers in schools about what they were doing to black kids and so on for certain hours of the day, getting up to sing my Latin at 4 o'clock in the morning and being normal <clears throat> as a priest for the other hours of the day. And so my activism started even when I was talking to the fellow up there. Right. And um, uh, just to briefly come back to the point you make about Sheila Patterson, because it, when you watch the... Um, uh, the movie there, you see when, th when people arrive, they've mm. got British passports. And um, I'm thinking of two quotes in particular. One, uh, almost an incantation from Sivanandan, who would say, we are here because yes. you were there yes. to uh, explain <coughs> the black presence in Britain. And the other from uh, Gilbert in Andrea Levy's book, Small Island, mm. where he mm -hmm. says, how do you not know we? Sure. You know, that we... I could point out anywhere in England, I could tell you all about your history, and you've never heard of us. And it seems as though in order to be politically engaged in a way that you were, you first had to teach white history, actually, to, yes, to the British people. I'm wondering how, in order to make the alliances you talked about in that interview, that um, you know, we have to work with others and progressive whites and so on, what kind of education you had to do in order to make sure that you were fighting as brother and sister and not as younger brother to older white sister or older white brother? Well, I mean, the education, as you would understand, was not, was not, uh, <coughs> was not formal. And it was done at the level of engagement. Hmm. Because remember, it, was not, it wasn't only a matter of dismantling the racism of the British state at state level. It was also the racism within the trade union movement. Um, and and that, that was dire. Uh, so you're quite right. Teaching history, I've always said that one of the major functions we as black people have performed in this society is to interpret Britain to itself. Yeah. The problem is that Britain is so damned arrogant that it can't even hear what we're trying to say to it never mind adjust as a result of what it has heard. And that has been the dialectic, so to speak, um, over the last 50 years that we've been here. Mm. So yes, we've had to do, we've had to do the, <coughs> the educating. And it is, in a sense, that kind of educating that we did in CARD. I linked up with white people of my age, went around trying to find a job or trying to find a room or whatever it may be, and I'd be told, no job, the job's gone, or there's no room. My colleague would step out, usually we're in a cafe drinking something or other, and go to the same people and, yes, come on Monday. When do you want the room? And that was rife all over the place. So it is, it is the fact that we were able to provide that evidence to the state that helped to give rise to the 1968 Race Relations Act. But, 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 but there was something... There was, there, was, there was something else, too. Um, the white working class had been used, really throughout history, to engaging in activism <coughs> on employment and, and, and labor issues, mainly through unions, and mainly in relation to the workplace. 
There was no tradition, for example, of white working class activity, agitation, on the question of schooling and education as this country experienced through what we did. So we were having to take on employers, take on unions that were reluctant to take on employers, and do all of that in the workplace, working harder than everybody else and for longer hours, and then go home and take on what the schools were doing to our children, the fact that the police were harassing them on the streets, the fact that we were being, being denied proper housing and so forth. So that whole cocktail, if you like, of issues, which were part and parcel of how we experienced the state and had to re respond to it, was something very, very new for the working class movement. And did that feel lonely? I mean, you're, t you're not only fighting, you're teaching people a new political language and with a relatively small group of people carrying quite a heavy load. It's, it's, did, w I'm intrigued as to how that feels when you're in it. Is it, is it uh, does it feel lonely? Does it feel uh, uh, on some level kind of uh, pointless? Or is it like, you know, this is, w we have no choice but to do this. What, what, tell us about that. Well, I think, I think um, yes, it was lonely. Um, one had to choose your allies carefully, even amongst <coughs> ourselves as black people, because we call ourselves black people or the black community. There's nothing particularly homogenous about us. Mm. Some of us are revolutionary, some radical, some conservative, some decidedly reactionary. That's, that's us in all our diversity mm. as black people. So we had to choose our allies. And we had to, with those allies, break down barriers, open doors, through the work that we did. The Caribbean Education and Community Workers Association, for example, was a whole lot of us who met at the West Indian Student Center in Earl's Court practically every fortnight on a Sunday. Um, the most intense discussions, the second half of the 1960s, um, that gave rise to all kinds of things. Code and the book, the supplementary education movement, and, 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 and so on. So we had to find strength amongst ourselves and believe in what we were doing. That belief was strengthened and deepened because of our experience of struggle back in the Caribbean. Um, we imported that, and it, 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 it made us bolder, more assertive. Um, we could relate to the issues of, 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 of race and economy, issues of class, obviously, and begin to see how we can assist our children, particularly, in developing the strategies for coping with the racism that we know they were already facing. So you move on to um, the academy. Yes. Um, what's the impetus behind you um, undergoing further study and uh, w what, are the, what are the challenges? Well, I didn't undergo further studies immediately. I came to London from Oxford. <coughs> My parents were living in Acton in West London. Lived with them for a while. Tried to get a job. I wanted a job that was for ordinary people. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go into the construction industry. Is this when you became a grave digger? Oh, yes, the grave digger. <laughs> <laughs> the grave digger came a bit later. Okay. But I first tried construction, and I went into this building site, and saw some white fellows at the gate and in 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 the front of the building, and asked them where do I go to speak to a foreman or something. They directed me, talked to the fellow. Um, he wanted to know how hard my hands were. And I said to him, don't look at them now, but just remember, I came, I, I'm the son of a farmer, mm. and I've been farming from the age of five. <coughs> so I could begin to grow calluses on my hands again. Mm. Don't worry about that. <laughs> so he said, come back, come on Monday. And I was going through the gates, these two fellas, white fellas, burly guys, came up to me and said, how did you get on? So happy, I said to them, I'm starting on Monday. And one of them came, put his arm around me, walking me to the gate and says, 
if you walk in through these gates on Monday and start working here, by midday, you would have a bucket of concrete on your head, you effing nigger. Okay. Now, my mother always taught me that discretion is the better part of valor. <laughs> <laughs> and so I walked out of that place thinking, what an absolute cretin. And then I went and bought a bicycle and decided I would ride around London to try and see where else I might find a job without the bucket of concrete on my head. <laughs> so I'm riding through Chiswick and I see some guys in the cemetery and I go in there and say, oh, you got a job in here. And they looked at me very odd because they thought I didn't look particularly working class or whatever. Went to see the, the superintendent at the gate and he said, come on Monday, which I did. <laughs> <laughs> And I stayed. I, I, I loved grave digging. I mean, I was, it's my only industrial art. I'm, I, I'm very good at grave digging. <laughs> <laughs> and I left there prematurely because um, I was working in summer. There's no flu. People don't die at the rate of winter. Bad for business. Bad for business. So um, we, we had to clean up the cemetery. So I, I sharpened the blades on this rickety rotary lawnmower and went out after lunch to clean the, 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 the place. And so you move up one, uh, one lane or whatever it is, and you've got to uh, walk back in the same direction. And I stumbled on a urn that had fallen into the overgrown overgrowth, but the machine kept coming. And um, I looked down to find that half my foot was missing. So I grabbed up the other half. My, my man, the, uh, my, one, the, the fellow who was on duty with me, was on the other side of the cemetery cutting the hedge. So I had to alert somebody. So I grabbed up this thing, hopped over the, 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 the tombstones to where he could hear me, and he came running over. So he runs over. Fellow was six foot four, broad, sees my foot and immediately faints, <laughs> knocking himself out on a tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the, the, the superintendent people have called the, 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 the ambulance. The ambulance took what seemed like ages to come. Eventually, they arrived. And I thought, thank God. And then they went straight past me. I thought, what on earth is happening here? They went straight past me to my man because they discovered that he had a head injury. And that was more serious. So they took him away, and I had to wait another 20 minutes for an ambulance. Meanwhile, I'm bleeding to death. Wow. OK, so to cut that long story short, <laughs> I get I get. Taken. I said there aren't many stories that that are set in a graveyard where one person loses half a foot, well, that's, that's another person knocks himself out, that's quite so funny. Well, <laughs> that's, that's what my mother said. She said, you come to Grenada with your good foot, and you go and bury half of it before the rest of it. <laughs> she was a very humorous woman. So I get to the hospital. I lay, I'm laid out on one of those stretcher type things, white sheets, and I, I keep looking down, and you could see the circle widening. And I thought, oh God, these people are letting me bleed to death. So one nurse comes and says, is your name John Augustine or Augustine John? <laughs> I said, my name is Augustine John. She goes away. Ten minutes later, another one comes. Are you Mr. Augustine? <laughs> I lost it. I said, never mind what my pop, 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 pop name is. <laughs> You people are going to make me bleed to death in that place. I don't care what my name is. Go and get my foot seen to. She went off in a hurry. They thought I was going to get up and, and kick somebody, actually. And then, and then um, things, things started to, 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 to happen. But this gets repaired, mm -hmm. and I could walk again. I'm going to Leicester to deliver some talk or something. And I decided to put my crutches down and carry an overnight bag and a briefcase. Now, those are not crutches, right? Mm -hmm. 
So I'm on the escalator at King's Cross, coming from Acton Town, Piccadilly Line. Bags in each hand, and I get to the top of the escalator, loses my balance, and falls backward, rush hour, knock him down about 50. <laughs> I've never had such racial abuse in my life. <laughs> so, effing black bastard, drunk at nine o'clock in the morning, oh God. <laughs> Yeah, I think you said the, the, the state of race relations right. back about 20 years. Right? Indeed, absolutely. So, so um, uh, I had to give up the grave digging mm -hmm. and then went to do a diploma, postgraduate diploma in youth and community work. Um, and then was sent by Runnymede to do this research in Hansworth. Mm -hmm. Then went to Manchester and taught youth work at the Department of Youth Work at Manchester University, did another sociology degree there, and um, then continued with more research and so forth until I went to, came to London to work with the Inner London Education Authority. The whole time continuing to be uh, uh, an activist and a voice within the community. So I'm wondering how you decide to mesh the relationship between the street and the ivory tower. You're, you're rising in the academy and you're dealing with uh, issues of some of the hardest to reach working class black youth. Um, how do you unite those disciplines? Well. I went into the academy with the view that theory should arise from practice and theory should inform practice. So I have never been a, the typical academic um, writing papers and having them reviewed by my peers and writing more papers and writing more books. And um, I, I love academics. Huh? I mean. Mm. But, but there is a certain irrelevance, frankly, in, what a hell, in a hell of a lot of what we do. Mm. I wasn't going to that, go into that particular basket, no way. Um, I found it arid, I found it sterile, I found it pretentious. And if you want to find some rather pompous people, just check any academy. <laughs> so that was, that was not for me. And as a matter of fact, the very reasons why I left Blackfriars and engage with children and education and schooling and so on and so forth, were the reasons why I felt if I could not, as an academic, engage with communities in a manner that enabled them to give direction to their struggles, provide them with the information and knowledge with which they could empower themselves, give them the tools for doing their own research, rather than having all kinds of people come and researching upon them, then I would be totally useless. Say it. <laughs> right? So, so it, is, it is in that sense, I suppose, that I became seen and known as a public intellectual. Um, and I've had, I had all kinds of contestations with people in the academy. I left the University of Bradford, where I was working as a lecturer in social policy and applied social studies, because I took part in the George Lindo campaign. I went to the Crown Court to present a, a, an expert witness report, which was a, a, a forensic um, linguistic analysis of a 13-page statement that the police said Lindo had written and signed. He was Jamaican. I took him into the language lab at the university, got him to speak into a microphone, got him to write, we had a conversation, he read, and then I went home that weekend and analyzed the whole thing against this 13-page police statement and produced my report, which Ian MacDonald, the barrister in the case, used in the Crown Court appeal. <clears throat> the judge was totally convinced when he saw the analysis that, 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 that I had done they also discovered at the time that one of the policemen involved had, had been found to have um, fixed evidence in, in, in another case. 
and they, 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 they threw the thing out. But the, the, the punchline is this. While I am in the court delivering this witness statement to free this man from five years in Armley Jail, my professor, armchair Marxist, Maoist, Maoist, <laughs> calls our usual departmental meetings. I had already tendered my apology by putting a note in a pigeonhole. So I go back there and she's livid. Calls me into her room and says, I really do think you need to decide whether you're an academic or a political activist. <laughs> and I said to her, well, if for you, my friend, it is either or, I don't want to be part of this place. And I packed my bags and I went off to Manchester to do some more activism. Um, <clears throat> and the whole time, and uh, Lynn Quasi Johnson points this out, you are not just managing to uh, uh, campaign, but actually to intervene on a policy level, which does involve dealing with the, you know, the, the realities as we find them, not as we uh, would like them. Uh, that takes you to, to Hackney, eventually. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just interested in how you apply uh, both uh, the theory uh, that you have been accumulating through your education, the, the practice that you are accumulating through your community organizing within th such a uh, formal uh, uh, context where papers need to be pushed around and uh, frankly, arse needs to be kissed and things need, you know, that within an institution and a bureaucracy that has its own demands and its own <coughs> needs, how you, um, how you deal with that? The first thing to be said is that um, I've been guided for a long time by my guru, now passed on, uh, Paulo Freire. Freire <coughs> has this wonderful saying, nobody is superior to anybody. Armed with that, I was able fearlessly to face down some head teachers, some of whom were grimly racist, face down the counselors within Hackney Council, And to draw upon all of that stuff that I had been doing since the 1960s with the children in Oxford, whose education rights I was fighting for then, to demonstrate to the head teachers and the, ed the educational establishment in Hackney that things could be different and must be different. They had to debunk some myths, develop a different mental attitude develop a, a different view of education and schooling if they were going to give every, children their education, every child their educational entitlement. And as Shirley Chase was saying in the film, it, it wasn't easy. Um, um, it's only because I, 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 I thrive on a fight <laughs> that I was able to survive eight years in that damn place. <clears throat> and keep your sanity. Absolutely. Well, okay, it's not just... That's flippant. It's not just the fact that you love a fight, a, a fight. What kept me sane in Hackney was my spirituality. I don't mean religion. Mm. Um, the way I organize my mind at the start of the day when I greet the universe, <coughs> the way I, 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 I present myself to the world, I have a holistic view of my balance with the universe. Um, and so I fortify myself. There were times when I was up at two o'clock in the morning writing reports for that place. And then I'll be up again at six to do my spiritual bit for one hour and a half or whatever before I went into the, the office at eight o'clock. And that's the discipline that I imposed upon myself for a very long time when I was young. In order to go through my schooling, 
I had to go and tie my 17 goats out in the fields before I went to the river to bathe, to then go and cook lunch for my parents to take to the farm, lunch for me to eat at lunchtime, and then catch a bus at about half past seven or whatever it was. So when people say this man doesn't sleep, it's, it's been, it's, it's mutated in my genes. <laughs> and that, um, th that spiritual connection, which I know from talking to so many activists who get burnt out and who in different ways almost do lose their minds or lose their sense of uh, perspective or compassion or, or, or whatever. Does that, um, the spiritual connection that you seek, is that what remains from your religious education, do you think? Because um, that has to come from somewhere, doesn't it? I, I think it was, it was um, how should I say, it, it, I built upon it. Um, in those wonderful years I had in the Dominican order. And I owe a lot to the Dominicans. Um, it was the most rigorous education I could ever have had. Um, high quality. I mean, people talk about Jesuits, they were a joke. Um, <laughs> the Dominicans gave me an education second to none. And what I did at Mount St. Benedict in Trinidad as well. So that that to be able to think analytically, to be able to place yourself outside of situations and engage with them while at the same time not losing yourself, mm. all of that came through. But then I think from much earlier on, I had that attitude to, believe it or not, although I was trained to be a priest, from the time I was very young, I've always felt religion was humbug. Ironic, but that's mm -hmm. the case. And I, 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 I wanted to be this priest and be a different kind of priest because I was so fed up with what those people in those islands were doing and what they represented. Um, I mean, God knows what would have happened if I had stayed. Mm -hmm. They might have excommunicated me or something. <laughs> um, so so it, is, it is really how I saw, and I think that comes from the fact that I was a young farmer. What I did in the lands with my father, and I still go to those lands when I visit Grenada now, there is a spiritual atmosphere there, uh, uh, um, an elemental relationship with the soil and the, 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 the environment that um, I, I find it difficult to explain. But it does, it does something for me. Mm. From the moment I got here, I've always hated cities. I, I find them deadening, um, in spite of all the advanced art and culture and the rest mm. of them. Spiritually, I find them deadening. Which made me think when I was watching the, uh, the film there and you're talking about events in 83 in Grenada. Yes. At that time, because one of the challenges of migration is that you're away. I know this sure. from not living in Britain anymore even. Um, did you... Did you wish you were there? These are your peers involved in a major revolutionary moment that you might have participated mm -hmm. in yourself. Um, were you at all conflicted about being here? How did, how did you feel about that? I was well, very conflicted. I mean, as a matter of fact, as I said in the film, I was overjoyed when the revolution took place. Mm. Um, um, and I did try to engage. The very first International Book Fair of Radical Black and Third World Books took place in 1982 at Islington Town Hall. I wasn't here for it because I was in Grenada. I was hoping to be able to engage. My cousin, George Louison, was the Minister of Education. Um, and I wasn't, I, I, I wasn't the Director of Education then. I, I, um, I had not even joined the Inner London Education Authority then. I was a vice principal in Manchester. But my vision for education and what the role of education in nation building and how that might be operationalized in a post-revolutionary or, or rather a revolutionary context 
was, was, was such, I had a passion for going and engaging, and the bishop administration was doing some pretty fine things mm. in the vote, zonal councils and the, the popular education programs and so on and so forth. But when I got there, I encountered the Stalinism that um, um, Tim Hector was, 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 was talking about and Linton Kwesi Johnson in the film. Um, because I am there, and I, I would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, take my father's donkey, go up into the fields, plow some fields for them, sow some crops, so that when I went back to England, they had some stuff to, to, to reap. And this, this day, six vehicles came screaming to a halt outside our house. Paramil paramilitaries or military people with the AK-47s all over the place, ran up the stairs, positioned themselves. And I thought, what the hell is going on? They were announcing the arrival of my cousin, the Minister of Education. <laughs> now, his father, who was first cousin to my mother, lived just up the way. He's coming from the ministry in town with all of this paraphernalia around him. And then he sits me down in my, in my mother's living room and says, uh -huh, comrade, we see you, you come, uh, you've checked us out once, uh, but every day you're on this donkey going up into the hills. Um, what's, what's that about? I said, my friend, it is about feeding my parents. That's what it's about. I said, yes, but you don't come from England with all of these skills and so on. I said, well, yes, I did try to come and have a conversation with you about what it is I might do, and then encountered all sorts of foolishness <laughs> in trying to get through to you. And so I decided, you see this? I, one thing everybody knows about me, I can't stand stupidness. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to stay in my mother's house, befriend the donkey. <laughs> and the donkey would be my companion four miles up the Concord Mountains. We had a conversation, my cousin and I, and I asked a number of questions, and I frankly did not like the answers I was getting. And even then, there were all kinds of things going on about the, the Politburo and the Central Committee and all of that sort of stuff, which they superimposed on the Grenada situation. Right. And it just did not square with my own ideological position. Uh, and I did not believe that they were about to deliver workers and peasants power. Um, we are um, less than a couple of months away from an election. Um, uh, well, how do you see the political landscape, the electoral landscape, first of all, and the political landscape, which of course are not the same thing? Dire. <laughs> Dire. Both? Absolutely. Um, one, of the, one of the things that troubles me about, about Britain just now, and for the last few years really, is the, the fact that it becomes increasingly difficult to identify the difference between the two big parties, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. Um, I despair of the Labour Party, and I mean that seriously. And is that new, or, no. it's just the, or is the level of despair new? No, the level of despair has deepened. Right. Um, but the, the fact of despair is... is yes, the, the, the film said that uh, I worked with Jack Straw as one mm. of his advisors, mm. and he and I got on very well. I was made chair of the agenda committee of his forum. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we sat with civil, serv sit with civil service and determined what would be on the agenda of these meetings which Jack Straw chaired. Mm. And I used to say to him, if you people do nothing else, for God's sake, we've had 18 years of Thatcherism, all of this stuff about individualism and the rest of it, reconfigure the political agenda 
See what has happened in those 18 years in relation to schools, in relation to welfare, in relation to the state, and particularly in relation to issues of race and social exclusion. I think his heart was in the right place. And I think that's borne out by the fact that it took him to approve the Stephen Lawrence inquiry into Stephen Lawrence's death or murder. But in spite of all of that, Jack Straw did not feel he could take the rest of those people with him. Um, and all sorts of other things were going on at, at state level, which, 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 which disturbed me a great deal and still does. My abiding belief is that those political parties since the Second World War have done this country a massive disservice by not acknowledging that the legacy of empire needed to be attended to. And one of the imperatives that arises from acknowledging the legacy of empire is to put race at the center of the political agenda. That they've never done. I'm an educationalist. The troubles we've had to get them to understand that education must be about humanizing society, must be about social liberation. It's not just about equipping people with skills for the economy. You can do that too. Those things aren't mutually exclusive. But you must have a vision of what kind of a society you want. So when you look out at the education agenda and you see the part privatization of schools and the academies and all so that. on. All that. Um, so where do you see hope then? Where do you see resistance? You've been involved in resistance in some way pretty much all your life. That's what we've been seeing. You like a fight. Mm. You told us that tonight. So who do you fight now and how do you fight and who do you fight with? I fight with the so-called black community. <laughs> I fight with people like Operation Black Vote. And let me be clear about what I'm saying here now. I fight with those who believe that there is apathy within the black community, because I do not believe that that is the case. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people who feel decidedly defeated, but that's a different thing. The, 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 the issue I have is this. There's all kinds of things happening to us and have been happening for, for years. When I was researching that stuff in Birmingham for the Renimi Trust in 1968-69, I was dealing with issues of police, stop and search, criminalization of young black people even then. Now the prisons are full of people like us. Um, the state feels it can't cope anymore or it has swallowed the, the privatization pill to the extent that it is now asking Circo and, and Group 4 and whoever else to build prisons to contain us as the majority of people within those places. And I call those prisons the new slave plantations. <laughs> because that's, that's, that's what they are in my book. OK, so all of this is happening. The largest number of children excluded from schools are black children. Um, once there is a squeeze, uh, black workers, however long they've been in the place, are the first to be chucked out. In spite of all of that, we're being expected to throw our lot in with the Labour Party electorally and put them in a position to continue messing us up. Now, I don't, I don't want to overturn the democratic system in this society. Um, it's too big a task for me. Right? <laughs> what I do want, however, is for us to wake up to the fact that all of these statistics I've just used, that disproportionality is not incidental. It's got nothing to do with our genetics as black people. The murders of all of these young people on the streets, even by other young black people, is no indication that we are genetically prone to murder and mayhem. 
Now, if we accept those propositions, the question then is, what imperative does that place upon us as communities? Even if we're members of the Labour Party, that agenda is finished. It, it's, it's got no use or relevance to us. So my hope is in those young people you saw in the film. And they said much more, as I understand it. They, they chucked me out of the room. I wasn't there. But they said much more than you saw depicted here. And it is their vision of the society they want to build. And the ownership of the fact that as black Britishers, they have a right to determine that vision and build that society, just as well as everybody else. Much more so than Neil, Nick, whatever his name is, Clint. Farage. Oh, Farage. They, this is the other one. <laughs> Nigel. Neil, Nigel, Nick. <laughs> So, I believe that my responsibility, therefore, which is why I mentor young people, and at least four of those you saw in that film are young people whom I mentor, is to ensure that I provide them with the tools for understanding and the tools for action, so that they could empower themselves, feel more confident about the capacity to shape this country and its future, and know that there would be all kinds of obstacles and barriers, et cetera, that they have to overcome, but that by working collectively, they could bring about change, making alliances with other people and other movements, and make the future they face, the future they actually want in this society. Thank you.